Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. You know, once you have a thorough understanding of the orbital periods of the moon and the earth and the sun, you may be able to find some cycles to the solar and the lunar eclipses. One such cycle is called the Saros cycle, and today we're going to have a close look at it. So cue up the music and let's get going. Now the orbit of the moon has got three periods to it. The first is what we call the lunar month, which is new moon to new moon. That's about 29 and a half days. Specifically, it's 29 days, 12 hours, 44 minutes, and three seconds. Then we have something called the anomalistic month, and that is the period from perigee to perigee of the moon's orbit. And that is 27 days, 13 hours, 18 minutes, and 33 seconds long. And finally, we have something called the Draconic Month, which is the ascending node to the ascending node period of the moon. And that's 27 days, 5 hours, 5 minutes, and 36 seconds. If you combine all three of these cycles, you come up with something called the Saros Cycle. And that is actually 6,585 days and then between 7 hours 43 minutes to 12 hours 53 minutes because it doesn't work out exactly. But it works out to be roughly 18 years and it's offset one third of a day. Now what the Saros cycle describes is the relationship between two eclipses that have nearly the same geometry. The difference between the two would be that they are shifted 120 degrees west due to the fact the Saros cycle has that eight hours in it, and they're also shifted 300 kilometers either to the north or the south, depending on whether the cycle starts at the North Pole or the South Pole. Let's go into that a little bit. Now recall that in order for a solar eclipse to occur, the moon must be located at either the ascending or the descending node of its orbit around the sun. The moon's orbit is offset approximately five degrees from the ecliptic, which is the plane of the Earth's orbit around the sun. As the moon is above the ecliptic, passes through the ecliptic, and goes below the ecliptic, that's called the descending node. And you can see that right here. The moon's coming around this way here above the ecliptic, and then it passes through the ecliptic right here at the descending node and continues below it until eventually it goes through the ecliptic again in the ascending node on the other side of its orbit. It makes one full orbit once a month and passes through each node once. Now eclipses that occur as the moon passes through the descending node are given even numbers of Saros cycles the ones that occur as they pass through the ascending node are given odd numbers. We'll give an example of this in a little bit. But let's start off with eclipses that start with the descending node. The first eclipse of a Saros cycle is as the moon passes through this descending node and the penumbra of the moon's shadow just touches the south pole of the earth. Now, after about 10 or 11 Saros cycles, which are 18 years apart, the first total solar eclipse will occur in the vicinity of the South Pole. Now, for the next 950 years, every 18 years, there will be a similar eclipse that occurs on the Earth, 300 kilometers north of the last eclipse that occurred, and approximately one-third of the way, or 120 degrees, to the west of where the first eclipse occurred. And it'll proceed to march up for about 950 years, and eventually we will get a final total eclipse of the Sun at the North Pole, and then we will get partial eclipses for another 10 or 11 cycles, and after 1,200 to 1,500 years, the cycle will be completed. Now let's go ahead and give an example of an actual sorrow cycle. This is cycle number 145, which means that it occurred not at the descending node, but at the ascending node on the other side of the Earth. And unlike the eclipses that begin at the descending node, ones starting at the ascending node begin at the North Pole. Now the first eclipse of Saros 145 was a partial eclipse 
at the North Pole in 1639. Now, we continued to have partial eclipses at the North Pole for another 200, 250 years, with the first total solar eclipse occurring in 1891. Every 18 years thereafter, in 1909 and in 1927, the eclipse moved 300 kilometers south and 120 degrees to the west. So, for example, if we had a solar eclipse from this cycle that was seen in North America, we would not see another solar eclipse from that cycle for another 54 years. It would have to be three cycles to work its way back to where it began. Now, in 1999, we had eclipse number 21 of 77 in this cycle, and it was the fifth of 41 total eclipses. The last total eclipse of this cycle will occur in the year 2648, and the last partial eclipse of this cycle will occur in 3009, and then the cycle will end and another cycle will replace it. Now this map looks at the Earth from one location above the North Pole, and you can see where the solar eclipses will occur. Unfortunately, this looks like a hodgepodge to most people, so let's see if we can figure this out in a little more organized fashion. Instead of looking at a fixed location on the Earth, let's look at the path of totality for each eclipse, and that would be right here. Now we can actually make some sense of this. So right here, we have an eclipse in 1937, and this is the path of totality. Now notice that this is right under North America. 18 years later, in 1955, we have a path that is very similar in shape, as you can see, but it's rotated 120 degrees to the west and appears in the western Pacific. 18 years later, it's over in Africa in 1973. 18 years later, we're back in North America in 1991, and so on, and so on and so on, and so on, and so on. And this goes all the way up to 2081. So you can see how the progression of this cycle goes. Now here's a good question for you. If the Saros cycle only repeats every 18 years based on the orbit of the moon and the periods of the moon, how is it that we have two to five solar eclipses on Earth every year? Generally one in July and one in January. Well, the answer shows why it is so difficult to try and come up with an organized cycle of eclipses without understanding the orbital mechanics of the moon. And that is that at any given time, there are 40 or more Saros cycles underway. Recall that each Saros cycle only describes a particular geometry for a solar eclipse following a very specific path across the Earth. Notice the interesting thing about these paths. They all look relatively parallel to each other because the geometry of the eclipse is nearly identical. Because the three cycles that compose the Saros cycle do not completely match each other, the three different cycles actually come to slightly different ends by a matter of about seven hours. So even though within one Saros cycle, the eclipses are related to each other, each Saros cycle is not precisely aligned with every other Saros cycle. And that is because of that seven hours difference. To try and figure out a Saros cycle without understanding the orbital mechanics of the moon is next to impossible, given the number of simultaneous cycles that are underway at any given time. Without that understanding, you couldn't make any sense of it. You would have to look at records for literally hundreds of years and have a lot of insight to try and pick out these patterns. That's why they were not initially described until 1691 by Sir Edmund Haley. But they were described only on the basis of a foundation of an understanding of the orbit of the moon. Now the interaction of these orbital periods is fascinating and I've put some links to some further reading that you can do if you would like to learn more about these cycles. I was fascinated when I was researching it and I'll be looking into it again for our next video on the lunar eclipses. So until then, this is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. 
Thank you very much for stopping by and for your support of this channel. Make sure you hit that little like and subscribe button down there, and I'll see you again soon. Take care.